Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Commissioners Chairman Candidate Forum. I'm Carol Brown with Canton Road Neighbors, and we're hosting this event with Bells Ferry Civic Association. I want to extend special thanks to Covenant Presbyterian for allowing us to meet in this beautiful sanctuary, and also want to thank everyone who has helped to make this forum possible. I particularly want to thank each of you for taking the time to join us to learn more about the candidate's position on issues as we prepare to vote in the primary this month. Our three candidates are Mike Boyce, Tim Lee, and Larry Savage. Our panelists tonight are Michael Stein, who was president of the Bells Ferry Civic Association, and Ken Dixon, vice president of Canton Road Neighbors. I'll be the moderator. Our panelists will ask questions with us that were solicited in advance from the community and were pared down to a list of 16. The questions cover a range of issues, but the overall focus is community development, which includes planning and zoning. Some of the questions are complex, and because we wanted to give each candidate adequate time to prepare, the questions were sent out to the candidates last Friday at noon. Because of the length of the list, we will not be taking questions from the floor. We will begin with the candidates' opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes. This will be followed by the first set of eight questions read by Michael Stein, and the second set of eight questions will be read by Ken Dixon. The candidates each have a minute and a half to respond to the question. If they go beyond that time, a bell will sound, and they must conclude. Upon completion of the questions, each candidate will have the opportunity to make brief closing remarks. I'm sure that we all want to hear the candidates' answers clearly, so please listen attentively and hold your applause until after the closing statements by the candidates. The meeting will then conclude, and you will have an opportunity to meet and greet the three candidates. Their campaign materials are also available in the foyer. <clears throat> the meeting is being recorded, and we will plan to post candidate responses online in PDF format and a video, uh, uh, link to the video, uh, which we believe will be on YouTube, will be made available as soon as possible. So let us now begin with the candidates' opening statements. Uh, we'll go from left to right this evening. Colonel Boyce will be our first speaker. Oh. Well, thank you, Carol. I also want to thank the Canton Road and uh, Bells Ferry Civic Associations for hosting this forum tonight. And I also want to welcome all of you to come to this beautiful church here at uh, Covenant Presbyterian. I know how busy you are. It's very difficult to come to break out during the week. So thank you for coming tonight to hear, uh, hear all of us. And I look forward to your questions. I'm in this campaign because I believe this, this, uh, this chairman no longer represents the will of the people. Both the chairman and the, and the board of commissioners have failed to answer one single, simple fundamental question. Why can we vote on two $40 million park bonds, but we can't vote on a $350 million stadium bond? The deal only makes sense if it's considered as a business proposition. There are those who believe that government should be run as a business. I do not agree. A government is led by a public servant who uses your taxes to produce public services. Biz government is not in the business of producing profits. Government is in the business of producing public services that needed to uh, enhance your quality of life. In a way, my five years of undergraduate training and my two years of and my one year of graduate training and uh, my other multiple courses have led me to this time where I believe I have the professional experience, both in developing strategic plans, being the mayor of a small town, leading a small business, and in leadership positions, all required essential to leading a government of this size. I'm mindful of that challenge and responsibilities that come with being your chairman, but I believe I'm prepared for them. And I look forward to uh, answering the questions tonight. Thank you. Uh, I am Larry Savage. I'm a candidate for chairman of the Cobb County Board of Commissioners. I was born and raised in Atlanta. I moved uh, intentionally to Cobb County because Cobb County was a very attractive place to live. I believe that then and I believe that now and I hope to believe it going forward. I have lived in Cobb County for 40 years and I have the benefit of historical perspective and a long view. I know where we have come from, what we have been and you have to know that to have any sense at all of direction for the future. I also have a sense for the entire Atlanta region, having spent most of my life here. 
And that's important because the Cobb chairman has an automatic seat on the Atlanta Regional Commission Board. This is an organization that uh, we are forced to interact with because they are the local surrogate for the federal government. Federal money is distributed through the Atlanta Regional Commission, so we, are, we have to do business with them. We do not have to be subservient to them. And I think that we, it's time for us to use our seat on the ARC board to represent uh, Cobb County's interests rather than bringing ARC interests into Cobb County. I put myself through college in a co-op program, earned a degree in engineering. I earned an MBA in 1970 from Georgia State University. I've spent 40 years in big industry, principally with two large multinational companies, and along the way I've owned five small businesses. So I have a sense for what it's like to be regulated, uh, for what it's like to put my own money on the table and take a risk and come away uh, successfully. But then I took an interest in the Cobb County government. For the last six years, I have shadowed the Cobb County government plunged to great depth in many cases. I have studied it like nobody else ever has over a long period of time. And it's important that you do this over a period of time because you can't look one day and, and really tell much about it. You have to watch it in motion. I've seen what works, what doesn't work, and I've seen things that need work. And my mission is to get hold of some of the things that need work, reform some of the processes, modernize them, bring them up to date so that we have openness and transparency in government so that any ordinary citizen can look in the window and see what's going on, how their affairs are being managed, how their money's being committed. I think my efforts, my background, my experience has made me the best informed, the best prepared, and the best qualified candidate to be chairman of the Cobb County Board of Commissioners, and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. As I've been going through this campaign and meeting with voters across this county, I have had an opportunity to reflect on the last five years as chairman. When I became chairman, we were in the worst economic times in modern history. But working together, as we do in Cobb County, we weathered this storm and are stronger today for it. We made the tough decisions necessary to preserve a balanced, fiscally conservative budget. In fact, during this time frame, fewer than 20 counties across this country were able to consistently maintain a triple AAA rating. I am proud that Cobb County not only maintained this rating, but our fiscal budgeting practices made us stronger than ever. The financial experts on Wall Street consider Cobb to be one of the most fiscally responsible counties in the country one of only 45. Under my leadership, Wall Street continues to recognize our fiscal responsibility, and I am proud in the past few years we have been able to reduce the millage rate three times in one of the few counties in the state that have been able to cut taxes to pre-recession levels. We have reduced the water transfer rate to its lowest point in over a decade. We've added 80 new police officers and implemented policies and practices to recruit and retain the best and the brightest in the public safety business. We have fostered the creation and retention of 20,000 jobs and a billion dollars of private investment. We have spurred reinvestment and redevelopment on the Canton Road Corridor and South Cobb. We have facilitated $1.2 billion of transportation investment to ease congestion across Cobb County and we've passed two SPLOSTs, resulting, resulting in an additional $1 billion of investment in infrastructure, public safety, parks, recreational programs, and libraries. I am proud of my conservative record and its proven results. And I will continue to implement fiscally conservative leadership moving forward as your chairman. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Lee, we'll start with you. As Cobb County expands, how do you plan to adhere to the comprehensive plan and accommodate growth and green space? I didn't catch you as directed to. To you. To me, great, thank you. Um, the, comprehensive, the comprehensive plan is a very important planning document and planning tool in ensuring quality growth in Cobb County. The county does weigh heavily in a decision-making process. In fact, 
It get guides development more than zoning process. I am a conservative Republican. I don't believe the government should require a private property owner to keep their property as green space. They are limited as to what they can do through underlying zoning. However, I am proud that Cobb County has one of the highest percentages of green space per square mile in all of Metro Atlanta. But we will always be striving to do more. Thank you. Mr. Savage, same question to you. Uh, the comprehensive plan is so bloated and complicated that uh, it, it's almost uh, beyond uh, comprehension, which is maybe a poor choice of words. But there are about 40 other plans that the county has developed over the years on all sorts of topics that have been included by reference in the comprehensive plan. And when you consider the comprehensive plan to include all of those things, it's really not possible for anybody to know what's in there because they're so vast and so many of them. And unfortunately, there's no way to know which ones of these things will be or will not be implemented at some point in the future. And if they are implemented, it's impossible to know if the entire plan will be implemented or just pieces of it. So it is not a very good communicator about the future. You can look in there and imagine just about anything. Unfortunately, the county can look in there and justify just about anything. So I really think the comprehensive plan needs a little bit of an overhaul to get it down to the size and shape that we can all go through it, understand it, and, and have an idea of what's coming forward in the future. Right now, that simply cannot be done. Uh, for growth and green space, uh, we don't have to consider those things as being mutually exclusive. We can have growth and still protect green space. One of the places we need to put more emphasis on growth is regrowth or redevelopment where we have places that have not uh, uh, kept pace with the modern economy or they haven't uh, been kept in good repair by the owners. When you have disadvantaged properties, distressed areas, that should be considered as a prime location for something new rather than having something new always requiring a green field. So I think redevelopment and, and reinventing some of the older spaces around the county should be a higher priority. Uh, we should give more attention to it and uh, make that a more important part of our future so that we can protect green space. And Colonel. Well, uh, if we continue on the current track we're on, we're gonna be at a million people here shortly. And that is a, uh, that is a number that's simply unsustainable uh, for local government. We need to find a way to address the development that's going on right now in Cobb County. Now, this is not to meant to discourage development. We should, however, strive to hold the density uh, applications for zonings to a manageable level and increase densities only in those areas where the community leaders working with their commissioners, the planning commission, uh, agree that there is a need for quality uh, changes in development. Such ideas as infills. Might be, uh, might be one way of looking at uh, addressing issues of regarding development or, or redevelopment. Another approach is to hold department and high density zoning to regional activity centers and work with others to uh, refrain from increasing the density levels already we have uh, in Cobb County and not increasing the ones that are on the, uh, on the comprehensive plan or the land use map. We should always remain aware that high density zonings today may be redevelopment sites tomorrow that require government subsidies as we're seeing right now. Finally, we should look at incentivizing redevelopment and we see, see what it takes to rejuvenate an area. This includes ensuring that our codes and ordinances both support community development, business, the business community and yet protect the property rights for the homeowners. For preservation of green space, we should look at developing a prioritization plan that backs both as buffers from construction and yet offers places where our residents can both relax and recreate. Thank you. Mr. Savage, we'll start with you on this one. Do you support the issuing of the 2008 Parks Bond? And if so, how, for how much and how should it be financed? Well, interestingly, the, the wording of the question uh, really exposes one of the dilemmas that I've encountered with discussions about this because a lot of people have taken the term parks bond to mean the same thing as park land. Uh, parks bond means borrowing the money. And I don't think we really need to borrow the money. I think there are plenty of sources for money. 
uh, to do the purchasing. We just have to have the commitment to do the purchasing. Uh, the land has gotten away from us in some cases, and that's very, very regrettable. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of choice uh, opportunities to make purchases of land in the past that have been lost, but we can't continue to let these opportunities get away. Lost we have in enormous quantities. The current splice is probably going to raise a billion dollars in its run. Only 750 million is actually forecast for spending. So we've got about 250 million dollars in planned surplus in the current splice. We recently had a surplus of SPLOS money that probably was around $40 million. I never saw the total, but instead of using it to buy park land, which would have been a very defendable thing to do, that money was parceled out. The cities got their cut. Every department in the county got their cut, and the money just is now gone. Uh, so it's a matter of making setting priorities, and acquisition of land is something I think has to be given a much higher priority over some of the things we currently spend money on because we're not going to be able to get this land forever. It's going to continue to be developed. Owners are going to sell it. They're going to cash it out. Somebody's going to build on it, and there won't be any, any, any opportunity to acquire high-quality property if we don't move and, and make a plan to continue to move on it on a steady basis. Colonel. Well, I'm on record of supporting the two, uh, two funding the 2008 park bond. But the devil's in the details. And here's where you get in danger as, a, as a, someone running for office is making promises that you can't pay for. I'm still trying to figure out or hear an explanation as to what we can or can't do with regard to this bond. Can we, in fact, take it beyond the three years? Can we rescope it, reshape it in ways? So the bottom line is we're going to have to find, if we're going to fund the whole $40 million, uh, we're going to have to find ways to pay for that. Now. Uh, Roughly, if we take 1.1 mil uh, from, from uh, our millage rate right now to pay for the bond for the next three years, we can raise about 13 or 15 million dollars. If we use the whole 0 .33 as, uh, that we roll over from the 2006 bond, then we can raise about 25 million. That still leaves us significantly short of the 40 million dollars. So where are we going to find the money? Well, I think... Uh, We've been funding our reserve fund at a little bit higher rate than what we thought we were going to, so, or what I was told, so maybe there's some extra money there. The bottom line is, what is your priority and what is your commitment? So the answer is yes, I'm committed to finding a way to fund the park bond, but I need to do it both that's physically responsible as a Republican and as within the law. And I won't be able to do that until I am your chairman to find out what exactly it is we can or can't do. Chairman Lee. Thank you. Uh, First of all, I support issuing the park bonds. And in fact, I was the commissioner that moved forward and proposed to the board that we move forward on that action. And I am committed to making sure that the $40 million is fully funded. And just take a look at my record of the following through my previous commitments. Adding and securing funding for 80 police officers without raising taxes. Reducing the water fund transfer without raising taxes, and $1 billion of road and traffic improvement without raising taxes. I will consider every single source of existing and future funding available to fund the entire $40 million without raising taxes. My opponents simply need to go to my website and look under the heading green space to get the parameters of what's available today. Thank you. Colonel, how strictly do you read the rules on the use of SPLOSC funds? For example, if a project is not on the SPLOSC list, how do you justify spending SPLOSC funds on it? Well, as I said before, I understand why the citizens voted for SPLOSC. It's more or less to ensure that their tax dollars are used in a certain way. The problem, of course, is that over time, SPLOSC has not become used to buy special projects at all. It's now being used to, bun, to buy items, infrastructure, programs that were normally funded out, funded out of the general fund for the millage rate. So we need to get back to the definition of special projects. Uh, that's one thing we need to do. The second thing is, is that we need to make this based on needs and not wants. Um, it's just, it's just such, it's very difficult to, for me to understand how you can say 
that you're going to fund one item based on matching grants, and yet when the board votes for something that clearly isn't coming from a matching grant, that it's meeting the criteria established by uh, the SPLOS vote. You voted for special, for certain projects in your SPLOS. That is the only projects that we should be purchasing. I don't buy into this tier two or other programs. There's only one set of projects that you voted for, and that's what we should be spending money on. We should also in the future be looking at items that once you reach that limit uh, and have bought those projects and we find a way to stop that SPLOST and return the, the tax back to the 5% because we bought the items that we're looking for. So the item is, I'm a very strict interpreter of SPLOST and I do have some issues right now with how we're spending our SPLOST money. Chairman Lee. In July of 2014, after a significant public input process, the Board of Commissioners approved the SPLOS project list. In November of 2014, Cobb voters approved that list. The SPLOS list approved by voters included about 155 specific projects and multiple project categories. Resurfacing, 64 million, page eight. Drainage, 8.9 million, page nine. County bridge and box culverts, 3.5 million, page 11. Sidewalks and pedestrian improvements, 35 million, page 14. Intersection safety and operational improvements, 2 million, page 17. Roadway safety and operate, oops, yep, roadway safety and operation improvements, 6 million, page 19. School zone improvements, 4 million, page 20. Thoroughfare improvements and local match, 50 million, page 21. Planning traffic signal timing, traffic signals, transportation technology, 6.5 million, page 23. Public services technology improvements, general park improvements and paving improvements, 8.5 million, page 31. In each of these cases, there are no specific projects associated with the category. The DOT staff pro proposes projects to the board in these categories and the board then approves them. There is a stack of SPLOS lists in the back of the room similar to this that includes the information I just referenced. Thank you. Mr. Savage. I have the uh, SPLOS booklet at home. Uh, I have always uh, had a copy of it or downloaded it. In fact, the four-year SPLOS we just finished off, the one it's referred to as 2011, I don't think it was ever issued on paper. It was only available online because we went through the business of scaling it back from six years to four years. I have been a critic of SPLOS almost from the very beginning. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I do that really annoys a lot of people is I will go and read the rules. Uh, in this case, it's state law. The state uh, passed a law that allowed the creation of a SPLOST and the county has taken advantage of that. But what was set out in the beginning to be special purpose has turned into quite ordinary. A large chunk of the SPLOST money goes into things that are very normal everyday maintenance items such as periodically repaving the roads. In fact, you'll see a statement in the SPLOST book that says we don't have enough money. This is an explanatory statement. It says we don't have enough money to repave the roads every uh, 15 to 20 years like we should. So. Uh, if, if you want to repay those schedules, you have to have the SPLOST. Well, that's normal upkeep, and it's not special purpose, and, and I have resented that from the very beginning. If you read the SPLOST law, which I have done again and again, it stipulates in great detail how to administer the SPLOST program, and it does not allow for two lists of projects or three lists of projects, which is what we're up to now. And even, even the categorization we just heard about, those are categories. The law doesn't say approve categories of projects, it says approve projects. And the very first project that I saw rolled out on an agenda item for the 2016 SPLOST was to replace a bridge for $1.8 million. You would think $1.8 million bridge would be named, but it wasn't. It's not even our bridge. All right, Chairman Lee. What are your expectations and your experience balancing homeowners rights with the business development goals? Well, with all due respect, my opponents have no experience whatsoever on this front. For more than 20 years, I have been balancing homeowner rights with business development. Again, my track record speaks for itself. 
Ten years before ever becoming a district commissioner, I was president of my homeowners association, a board member of the Cobb County Civic Coalition, a director in the East Cobb Civic Association, co-founder of the Northeast Cobb Homeowners Group, and chairman for Citizens for a Greener Cobb. Once elected district commissioner, I worked with residents to help from Canton Road businesses to form the Canton Road Business Association, now called the Northeast Cobb Business Association. If you're looking for an experienced leader, that re-elect me as chairman of the Cobb County Board of Commissioners. Mr. Savage. Um, balancing homeowners uh, and, and businesses, I'll have to uh, contradict that. I actually do have experience in both areas. I am a homeowner and I have worked on defending my rights as a homeowner and I have been a business owner, including a, a business that was in a, right in the middle of a, of, a, uh, of a residential area one time. So that was kind of fascinating too. But, there, you know, that's one of the, I said in the introduction that, that having the long view of, of having been here for many years is kind of important, and this is one case. Uh, we have had a thriving development and business environment in Cobb County going way back years ago, even through the 70s and 80s when we had uh, booming residential growth and development and booming population growth. And, and these things are not naturally competitive with each other. You don't have to do one at the expense of the other. Uh, we had uh, a lot of cooperative relationships. Uh, we had uh, success in, in a lot of successful businesses were developed here and grew up here. And at the same time, uh, people were getting rich developing subdivisions. A lot of us were making ourselves happy by buying nice homes and moving into them. So I don't see these things as contradictory. And if we, if we get to the point where we have conflict developing between business interests and homeowners interests, I think we all have to get in a room together and we'll figure out what's gone wrong. Colonel. You know, when I first read this question, I'm going, oh man, they got me. And then I realized I'm looking, I'm looking way too small in scale. You know, for a number of years now, the uh, Chamber of Commerce has been working very diligently to ensure that Dobbins doesn't uh, become a victim of the base realignment and closure process. And I've had extensive experience in that. I've been to two bases that were involved in that process. And most people don't realize that the BRAC process involves when you close a base or you realign the base, working with the business community to ensure that the land use transfer that's going to go to the private, private businesses or to, or to local uh, institutions meets a number of development standards. So I have a lot of experience in that. So to say that I have no experience in this, well, that's a little bit of a stretch again. And as far as homeowner rights, I go back to my time as the mayor of a, most people think that if you're a uh, mayor of a military base that it has no involvement in homeowners. That's absolutely not true. You spend a lot of time working with the local community to ensure that their needs and their concerns are met or addressed as I try to bring to them my point of view of needing my base and my uh, operating around that to meet my operational tempo requirements. So I have a lot of experience but on a much bigger and broader scale addressing both business development and homeowners issues. Uh, just not at the local level, but I would, I would say that I had experience dealing with the fundamental concerns and, and processes that everybody does in trying to combine business development and homeowners' concerns. Mr. Savage, next question will be, start, we'll start with you. What is your stance on the Residential Senior Living Code Amendments proposed in January of this year? Do you support reinstating the existing continued care retirement community code that is currently under a moratorium? You know, that was what, that uh, all relates to the uh, development of the Tritt property for Isaacson Living uh, Senior Community. And there were so many people involved in that that uh, I really never got into it in great depth. My understanding is that the latest changes into the RSL code was to basically take some of the features from the, uh, uh, the other code, the CCRC, and bring it into the RSL to accommodate uh, what people wanted in that development, but yet exclude some of the things that the community around it had decided was offensive. I think everybody involved was caught a little unprepared for the level of resistance that was found in the community to the Isaacson Living proposal. 
Uh, I wasn't involved in that, but I talked to a lot of people and read the stories, and my take on it is that a lot of people did not like the institutional look of the multi-story buildings. Uh, they were concerned about uh, the, what was basically looked more like a, um, an apartment complex in some respects, and that's not what they wanted in, uh, in East Cobb. But you also have to remember that this came on the heels of Wellstar having developed the health care park just up the street, and that met a lot of resistance, but then people found out Wellstar could put it there if they wanted to. They were just being polite, asking for favorable zoning, but Wellstar has certain rights as a hospital authority. So it came right after the Wellstar thing, and I think that may have ramped up the resistance a little bit because uh, the whole thing of Wellstar, uh, with the Wellstar project was, don't worry, this will not precipitate any further development down 120, but it did. And the, uh, the Isaacson Living Project looked like something that people had been promised wouldn't happen. And I, that, I think, had something to do with the resistance. But we have other senior living facilities. I'm sorry. Colonel. Well, just a small tutorial for those who are not quite sure the distinction. Uh, you know, for residential senior living, there's a couple categories. There's supportive and non-supportive is like a nursing home. And then non-supportive is pretty much like an active senior. And then the CCRW is like one step above the supportive part. And what, uh, and I, and what Larry said, uh, is, I, I believe, is accurate. They tried to make a third subcategory of RSL, uh, taking it from the definition from the CCRC. Well, the problem, of course, is that you, it involves densities. Uh, for unusable land, if I got my, my understanding right, you can use unusable land in the CCRC or community, uh, community and care retirement community for figuring your densities, whereas in your residential senior living, you cannot. So what happens is if you have a CCRC area that has lots of wetlands, all right, you can include that in your density level, which means that you're going to, on the, on the land that's actually usable, you can increase the densities in there. And I think that was the concern about the CCRC. They saw it as a backdoor way of increasing densities. So the answer is, uh, I think we should leave the moratorium on the CCRC as it stands right now. Uh, but I'm not in favor of adding to the RSL categories either. We do not need to have one more you know, definition inside an already overly complicated uh, uh, zoning codes. Uh, they, do, they do well for the Planning Commission, but they really confuse the average homeowner and citizen, and we do not need to be uh, doing that anymore. Chairman. Several years ago, I led the initiative that created the RSL and the CCRC categories, working with residents, the industry, and subject matter experts. Since then, a lot of new information about the senior market, habits, preferences, etc., have become available. And I quite frankly believe that the residents from the greatest generation on earth deserve the best from Cobb County. And as such, so again, I have initiated a comprehensive review to make sure we are doing everything we possibly can to prepare for this growing portion of Cobb County's population. Thank you. Colonel, as Cobb County continues to grow, how do you plan to integrate new developments into existing communities in such a way that the new blends well with the established neighborhoods? Well, that, that's a really tough question because it requires a lot of considerations, moving parts. Uh, you know, frankly, with regard to new developments, I've already made my position known on that. We need to be very, very careful about increasing densities. Um, but we need to. We need to ensure that any of these developments will have a positive impact um, on our communities as they already exist. And, are, and more importantly, and this I think was getting lost in the equation, are fully supported by the surrounding communities. Uh, I've heard a lot of people over my last four months of knocking on doors of, they post a sign that I didn't see, and I woke up one day and there's a new development in the backyard. And we need to find some way of of uh, communicating better with those who will be impacted by the new developments or redevelopments. However, we must understand that certain persons or organizations have different agendas. That's called business. They, have, they need to make money. They need, that's, their, that's their objective. So we've got to find some reasonable balance and agenda for people to get together and find common ground and discuss these, um, these opposing points. Uh, I've already mentioned infield. That might be one way we can do it, where you 
The outside structure maintains the uh, nature of the, of the community around it. On the inside, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit different because it's, it's blocked by the exterior structures. Um, so the bottom line is, is that there are a lot, of, a lot of things we can do, but it goes back to my theme of an open and transparent government and that everybody has a voice at the table and I'll work to ensure that that's what we do uh, regardless of the nature of the instrument that we use to address these uh, development and redevelopment issues. Chairman. Thank you. Simply put, the majority of development in Cobb County is done by right according to the underlying zoning. And for those cases that do, not come, that do come before the board in zoning, I strive to strike the right balance between private property owners' rights and the concerns of our community. It's as simple as that. Mr. Savage. When I read the words uh, uh, integrating new developments into existing communities so that the new blends with the established, uh, the image that comes to mind is urbanization, meaning converting to a more urban style of development, which typically is more density and eventually becomes high-rise condos. Uh, we're getting a lot of apartment construction now, and the reason we're getting a lot of apartment construction is because developers had zoning for multi-unit uh, uh, housing, and they discovered there's not much of a market for condos, so they're building apartments instead. Uh, in any event, we're getting a lot more density, and I don't think that's a good thing for us, because when you are a pretty well-developed area like we are, and our development is built primarily around concept of single-family homes, there's, there's not much opportunity or not much availability to retrofit your infrastructure to accommodate a tremendous growth in population due to high density housing. So I think if you want to live in a high density environment, you should move to a high density environment. We, if we start trying to convert Cobb County to a high density environment, we're going to make it a very unpleasant place for a lot of people because it, the infrastructure is just not going to match uh, the housing. Chairman, the comprehensive plan shows a groundwater recharge area in the large swath of districts two and three. Do you think that the county gives this adequate attention when various types of development are being proposed? Yes, period. Yes, we do. The, the tricky question here is that we have very, very little groundwater available for use by people here in Cobb County. Uh, it's primarily due to the soil conditions in which we live. So this question may be more relevant for new homeowners and wells, but that are few and far between. Simply put, we have a granite bedrock between Cobb, beneath Cobb County that limits our use of groundwater. And as such, our primary sources of drinking water are both the Chattahoochee River and Lake Altoona. Therefore, our source water protection efforts focus on these two sources and involve Cobb County, and the Cobb County Marietta Water Authority, who is actually the entity that draws the water, cleans it, sells it to Cobb Water, who then distributes it to the residents and businesses of Cobb County. Thank you. Mr. Savage. You know, I spent the last six years embedded in the Cobb County government. I looked at just about every piece of it that I could find to look at. And I've said before that uh, every time I turn over a rock, I find another rock pile and have to start turning the rocks over again because there's an awful lot of moving parts and a lot of things to study and a lot of things that really will pique my curiosity. I have never heard of this. I'm sorry, but I have been looking at Cobb County very closely and I have never heard of this. It, it touches something I have had an interest in for a long time. You know, we hear in Florida about people who, uh, in areas where they have a lot of well water usage and they have these giant sinkholes uh, develop and suddenly people's houses are disappearing into sinkholes. It's because they've sucked all the groundwater out and, is, and, and, and the soil starts to compact itself. So it has been a, a point of curiosity in my mind for a long time that we don't have a lot of well water use around here, but I still wonder about depleting aquifers. You hear about this out in the West. Uh, where aquifers are measurably being depleted, uh, where there's a lot of farming that, you, that is water intensive. Some of the crops are more water intensive than others. So I have wondered about getting it back, but honestly, I didn't know we had such a thing here. Uh, there's this uh, uh, recharge area. It makes all the sense in the world. And if we, if we are measuring and monitoring our aquifer and, and see a need to replenish it, then certainly I think that's something we should be trying to do. Colonel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm not a hydrologist. I'm just a helicopter pilot. And I'm like Larry. So I scrambled. And I called some people. And by George, uh, it's not in the county, but there is a count, a Georgia rechargeable area map. And I'm not just saying this to, you know, just, just found it because somebody pointed in the right direction. Uh, but I found some interesting things about recharging. Uh, how water recharges in the ground. And I think the county is maybe indirectly or uh, as a consequence of doing the right thing is, 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 la is lending to that. I found out that retention ponds, you know, because at the bottom they're impermeable. The reason that they hold the water is that the water can't go anywhere. But it does leach back into the ground on the edges. So that's why wetlands are so important. You know, wetlands are wetlands because on the bottom it's the impermeable surfaces, uh, surfaces but around the edges of the, of the wetlands, that's how the ground is recharged. Well, the same thing with retention ponds if they're natural retention ponds. So in the process of building retention ponds in the county, we might in fact have been adding to uh, the recharging efforts of the natural process of recharging this, in, this, uh, in this county. But that's just an opinion. Um, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that I'm an expert on it in any way, shape, or form. But I did have a lot of fun studying it. And, um, and my, my sense is having getting around the, the counties in, in my canvassing, there are a lot of open spaces out there where we're being allowed to, uh, the ground to, uh, to leach the water back into the underground, underground uh, recharging area. All right, Mr. Savage. Would you be willing to require that zoning applications or new development be consistent with the future land use map? And how comfortable are you with the practice of spot zoning? You know, I've, 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 I've sat in a lot of uh, zoning hearings, I say hearings, uh, meetings, whatever you'd like to call them, and, uh, and watched things happen for a long time before I ever began to read up on exactly what was supposed to be happening. Uh, there are laws on the books that, uh, that control how these things are done, and, and quite frankly, you wouldn't know that from observing how things are really done. I, and I have listened to people discuss and debate various zoning cases, and it, more often than not, it turns out to be, do you like it or do you not like it? Not does it comply or not comply. It is a common practice in Cobb County to zone without regard to the future land use map, and I think that's a big problem because somewhere an ordinary homeowner ought to be able to look at something that says what the future is going to be, and the future land use map would be very helpful, except that it does not represent the future. It is only treated as a suggestion. At the end of the year, uh, the, county, the Board of Commissioners passes a single revolution, a resolution that approves changes to the land use map to bring it up to date with all the zoning cases that were approved in the course of the year. I think that's backward. Uh, I think that the zoning or uh, the uh, land use map should be changed before zoning is changed and if they have to take a separate vote on that then take a separate vote because by doing so it becomes apparent to the public that, that something's going on there that they might want to take a look at. I'm not saying they shouldn't be allowed to do it, it just should be done in a way that makes it visible to the public uh, that this long-term planning document is subject to constant revision. Colonel. Uh, I'd like to answer the second part of the question first. Uh, I, I don't support spot zoning um, unless there's a real clear and compelling reason for it. And in my definition, a clear and compelling reason is something that has strong community support. Um, I would also like to underline that the comprehensive plan and the future land use map, uh, like many other products produced by the county, are done in conjunction uh, with business community, the public, the county staff. There's a lot of investments by people and organizations in these products. And I think it's important that we respect their, their effort by complying with these, with these products, whether it be the future land use plan or the comprehensive plan or the zoning map, as much as possible. Uh, they weren't produced overnight, and I see no reason why we should change them overnight unless there's a strong and compelling reason to do so. Chairman. Private property owners have the right to make requests of Cobb County any time, any day. The board will then make a decision on those requests based on the future land use map, which is a community, community developed policy guide for quality redevelopment. Cobb County cannot require that private properties 
owners meet regulations that are policy in nature. I believe the government should take the rights, should not take the rights of private property owners, or I'm sorry, I believe the government, our government, should take the rights of property owners very seriously when making our decisions. And I am not comfortable at all with spot zoning anywhere in this county. Gentlemen, this concludes my portion of the evening. Thank you very much. You did a great job, Michael.